began October 24, 1992, 11 days before Bill Clinton was elected president, Tommy Frazier was named field general, the first true freshman quarterback ever to start for Nebraska. It will end with his 35th start, when Frazier plays his final game for the Huskers. Now, I've been through it all. I think I've experienced pretty much everything. On and off the field, few college careers compare with Frazier's. 31 victories in 34 starts, four straight Big 8 titles, one national championship. Those are the ups Frazier will forever remember, but he admits to downs that he'll never forget. His only regular season loss at Iowa State in 92. Teammates in trouble who tarnished his school's reputation, and those blood clots in his leg last fall. Tragic. It was the first time I ever experienced something like that. Something that I never want to experience again, but I know it could be out of my control, but it's just something that always going to be in the back of my mind that how long I had to live in the hospital bed and not being able to do anything. While others seem certain that Frazier's season, if not his career, was over, he was not. And after Brooke Behringer led the Huskers to seven wins in Frazier's absence, it was Frazier who came off the bench to rally them to a come-from-behind victory over Miami for the national title, reminding everyone that Tommy Frazier's greatest gifts may not be his knowledge and speed. They realize that uh, he'll lay it on the line, you know, physically. He's willing to pay whatever price he has to pay to advance the football. And so uh, if he expects that of other people, uh, they're certainly not going to be offended when he, uh, when he asks them to step up their play a little bit. I go out and play with the tenacity of, of a defensive lineman or a defensive back or a linebacker. I feel that if I'm, be, I'm out there too, I'm going to have to give a block. I'm going to have to take some hits. I'm not going, I'm not the type of player that fights to slide before he gets hit. He is demanding of himself and of his teammates. So much so that when the team voted for captains before the season, the somewhat aloof Frazier, who was closer to a Vince Lombardi than a Dale Carnegie, was not elected. His way of motiva motivating people and getting the best out of them may not be liked by a lot of people. It's, it's uh, you know, compared to one of those coaches who yells and screams and, you know, probably want to jack you or something if you weren't doing something right versus someone who's, uh, you know, encouraging or something like that. You know, you screw up, Tommy, Tommy Frazier's down your throat, and a lot of people don't like that. He's going to jump on us no matter what it is. He's he going to get on you, but then he'll tell you, don't worry about it. Get on to the next play and make that play. Go ahead, go, go right. Yeah, that's part of the leadership role, that you're going to have to try to go out and get the best out of each player. And if you say something to them and they don't like it and it hurts that feeling, and then they say, well, I don't like him, then that's all part of the job. I think most of them view him as a, as a coach, you know, let them know hey, you got to get it, you got to get it done. And, you know, sometimes he might, you know, get on them too much and, you know, that might get that view as, you know, he think he know too much. But, but you know, that's Tommy Frazier. Is it fair to say maybe you're not the most popular player, but you certainly are one of the most respected? That's fair to say. You know, there's a lot of guys who like me on this team. There's a lot of guys that dislike me. But I think more guys respect me more than they like me. I think he hit it exactly on the head. I mean, I think Tommy Frazier, is respected by more people on this team than, than uh, you know, any other player on our team. But as far as a popularity contest or something like that, you know, I'd probably agree that there's there's some people on our team who uh, they don't necessarily not get along with him, but he's he's everybody's not real buddy buddy with him, and that's that's because that's the way Tommy Frazier is, and the way he's always been, from that first start to his upcoming final start, never a captain, always the general. What about the general's assignment tonight, Lee? Chris, to beat the Gators, Tommy Frazier must throw the ball as he did against Colorado. 241 yards and one touchdown. When they're running it, they're tough. When they're throwing it, impossible to stop. Well, he is best when he's moving around. Get him out of the pocket, let him run, create opportunities for himself and for his teammates. And in the fourth quarter, close games, they look to him just like the 49ers look for Joe Montana to bring them back. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, a special half-hour edition of College Game Day. Danny Wirth will get ready. We hope you'll stay with us. At sunset, another perfect desert night as two perfect teams get set to battle inside Sud Devil Stadium for the undisputed championship of college football. This is about as perfect as it gets under this system. College football fans everywhere get what they want. One versus two, no questions left after the game tonight. Lee Corso and the birthday boy, Craig James, are still with me. We'll get that rapper to sing a happy birthday a little bit later on. The Gators and their fans still seeking their first national championship for Nebraska. It's also kind of a first because it's been 39 years since a team has had back-to-back -back perfect consensus 
national championship seasons. Oklahoma did it. Four teams have had disputed titles among their back-to-back -back titles since then. Steve Cyphers has been hanging out with the Cornhuskers. Steve? Chris, you're right. Nebraska does have a chance to match that Oklahoma achievement. Not only that, should the Huskers win tonight, that will be 36 victories in the last three years. And no team in college football has ever done that. Yes, they can make history, but to hear Coach Tom Osborne talk about his players, they don't talk much about making history. They don't think much about history. They don't think much about uh, when was the last team to repeat, all those kind of things. And when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, what you ate for lunch is, is more important to you than what happened uh, a year ago, two, two years ago. I don't think we'll really pay attention about it in the immediate future, but maybe 10 years or 20 years or when we're sitting there with our grandkids on our lap talking about it, then I think we'll really, it'll really hit us then. It'll be most valuable just down the road, be able to say that I uh, played for, the, for Nebraska during that great stretch. And Graham hopes that stretch lasts at least one more game. One lineup change for the Huskers. Reggie Ball is out as starting wide receiver. Brendan Holbein is in because he graded better during practice. Not a big deal because the Huskers rotate those receivers in and out all the time. That's it from Nebraska. Mike Tarico, what do you have for us regarding Florida? Any lineup changes? Well, an injury of note, Steve. David Barnard, who's a starting defensive tackle, a senior, started every game for the Gators this year. He has a shoulder stinger. Game time decision. We're going to watch him work out here during the pregame warm-ups. We'll update you later on. Florida's a different story, I and mean, they've never been on this stage. I asked some of the players tonight as they walked in. They said it was pretty loose, pretty comfortable, relaxed day for Florida, hanging out, ordering room service, a couple of guys even going down by the pool. You may know Florida in the late 80s on probation. Florida has been in the shadow, the background behind Miami and Florida State. But tonight is their moment. We asked a player and a coach what tonight is all about for them. It's big time, and you know, uh, it's the Super Bowl of, of college football, and uh, shoot, it might be even bigger. I'm sure there are a lot of guys in the NFL who would love to play in this game. College football's huge, and this is what it's all about, Clash of the Titans, number one and number two. Every now and then somebody asks what, if we were to win this game, what it would mean to me, and, and certainly uh, it means a lot to everyone, but what it would mean the most for is all Gators, all Gators that have uh, endured over the years and uh, hung with the Gators through some down times, I guess you'd say. Well, if you're one of those who've hung with the Gators, you better send your karma here to Sun Devil Stadium. This place is like Lincoln, Nebraska. Three quarters at least, if not 80%, fans clad in red, 20% the orange and blue of the Gators. We'll be back inside here a little bit. Right now back across the street to Chris Lee and Craig. Mike, thank you. It's been a big issue all week. Who's been there, who hasn't been there? The Nebraska players say, hey, Trust me, until you get one of those national championship showdowns in the fourth quarter, you don't know what it's like. The Florida players say we have been there. Other factors and matchups to look for tonight. Well, Chris, Florida, watch for Florida to stack its defensive line early to try to stop the Nebraska run. And if they are successful, then strong safety Lawrence Wright from Florida must blitz the quarterback and play zone defense in the middle to stop the Nebraska offense. Now, keep your eye on number four, Lawrence Wright. He's good blitzing the quarterback. That's what he likes to do. But he also can play zone defense. If you notice in the middle of the area, he breaks to the outside and makes a very fine interception. The winner of this football game could be the team that does what they're not famous for. Nebraska throwing the football and Florida running it could be a key point. Very good point. And also in regards to Wright with the option that he's going against, he's got to maintain a lot of discipline because he is an aggressive football player. He's got to play his game out there. In terms of games, a lot of games we talk about reverses, fullback, halfback passes, things like that, trickery. Well, in this one here, I'm going to give you something else to look forward to. The fullback trap. Somewhere in this ball game, within the four quarters, it will come into play just like it did last year in the Orange Bowl. Look at the way the defensive guys are getting outside. Why? Nebraska runs the option. They run it so well, the linebackers and outside guys get out there to stop it. What it opens up is the fullback trap. Jeff McAvicka this year has taken over for Corey Schlesinger. He averaged 5.8 yards per carry. He is extremely talented. He's a good blocker. And when the trap's called, you got something to look for. And when you have a month to prepare, you look at a lot of film. And the Nebraska offensive players say they see Florida's 4-4 defense cheating toward the perimeter. Trying to defend that option. You're right. Watch for them to try to bust the fullback up the middle. A lot more to talk about on a special college game day as we approach kickoff across the street. Warming up for the Gators, the kicker, Bart Edmiston. He's used to kicking on grass, but beyond 30 yards this year, he's only made three out of 12. The playing surface has certainly been one issue this week. If you watch the 
Arizona Cardinals on the Cowboys on Monday night a week ago. You saw that turf all chewed up. Since then, however, the turf has had eight days to heal. Florida, of course, plays all their regular season games on grass. Nebraska, all of them this year on artificial turf. The Gators say it's a factor. The Huskers, naturally, downplaying it. We love playing on the grass. You know, we play well on the grass. We practice on the grass. So, I mean, I don't think it should, you know, should be anyone's advantage. I prefer natural grass. I kind of I like natural grass. I grew up playing on natural grass. I think this whole grass business is being blown out of proportion. We are happy that the game is on natural grass. Uh, they play 11 on AstroTurf. We play 11 on natural grass. So uh, we got to feel like the, the surface is a little bit to our advantage. If you're a good team, I mean, you're a championship type, type team, you have to be able to play on both surfaces, whether it's surf or grass. Uh, natural grass is just like coming home. It won't be a factor in the game because you have two teams that really want to win. You know, and we'll, we'll win at all costs. Now, the field certainly looks nice now, but how will it hold up for four quarters? For more on that, I sent my partners across the street this afternoon for a close-up look. Chris, in the old days, they never had any restrictions on length of cleats. It used to be an inch, inch and a half. They changed it to a half an inch to help prevent some of the leg injuries to the knees. But now, in this situation, the half-inch cleats and the grass, I think, is a disadvantage to Nebraska. Number one, when they go to rush the passer, you can't get a good grip on it like you do artificial turf advantage Florida. When Nebraska's guys drop back into the pass coverage and move, there's a tendency to slip on this. I think it slows the gate down. I think the advantage goes to Florida playing on a surface like this in the big game tonight. Coach, Nebraska players disagree with you. What's new? All right, let's talk about a former Florida great running back, Emmett Smith, eight days ago in this stadium. Same problem. Cuts on the inside foot. He goes down. I don't care how great you are. You've got to have proper cutting techniques. Here's what I'm talking about. You're going down the field. Boom. Outside legs, shoulders, everything's there. And you're cutting back, and you're going back to it. You're not going to slip. But if you're doing this, even Emmett Smith, boom, when you're doing that and you're making that cut, chances are you're going to go down. Even you, Fowler. <laughs> Let's hope guys don't have grass stains all over them. The weather is fine. Let's hope a sloppy field isn't a factor in a big national championship game. We continue the countdown from Tempe. Here's the Gators' weapon, Chris Doring, the SEC's all-time leader in touchdown receptions. We're coming right back. Stuff in about 15 minutes. You know, from the moment his plane touched down in Tempe, Steve Spurrier was bombarded by questions about coaching the Phoenix Cardinals. It was the same day Buddy Ryan got fired. Now, Charles Barkley is a guy who checks in on just about every civic issue in Phoenix, and he was asked what he thought about the possibility of Spurrier making Sun Devil Stadium a permanent home. I'll give Steve Spurrier, me and uh, Dudwell, I'll give Steve Spurrier anything he wants to come coach the Cardinals. I think uh, he's the best coach in college football. I really do. I think he's the best coach in college football. And, and Coach Spurrier, please come to Arizona and take me away from this. Dudwell, Dumbbell, anything like that. <laughs> Mr. Beardwell, I'm just joking. Please, please give Steve Spurrier anything he wants to come here and coach this team. I'll give you the dome. Me and Jerry Colangelo, we'll split the bill on your dome 50 50. It might take a king's ransom to get him away from Florida. Frankly, Spurrier doesn't rule out coaching in the pros. He had a good time in the USFL, plus, he needs it for leverage. He wants a big contract as big as Bobby Bowden's, and he thinks it helps recruiting helps attract those quarterbacks to have the NFL always coming after him in his offense. Chris, a year ago, I represented a gentleman, Gino Palla, who was interested in buying the Bucks. I was instructed to talk to Spurrier about being the head coach. We offered him all the money he could spend and a piece of the team. And he said, Lee, no thank you. Now, Craig, that's a year ago, but he did say no thank you then. I'm not so sure what he'll say now. Well, now you're trying to represent him this year. You probably didn't offer him that 950000 bucks <laughs> that he wants. <laughs> One thing that is for certain, the guy's a great football coach with an offensive mind, but I'm not so sure that he wouldn't have to make an adjustment if he coached in the National Football League today. Why? A lot of egos running around out there. Tom Coughlin, Jacksonville Jaguars. He takes the collegiate rah, rah, rah to there. Jacksonville says, get out of here, coach. We're not doing that. Same thing for Jimmy Johnson. He had a lot of rookies, first and second year players, and Chris, they were able to handle it then because they were used to it. It's a different game in the pros now. And Nebraska has not had to face questions about whether Tom Osborne's going to go to the NFL, but that's really about the only kind of question Osborne hasn't faced this season. It's been a very trying campaign. More on that. Back to Steve Cyphers. Well, you're right, Chris. You know, Nebraska is trying to wrap up the year with a national championship and an undefeated record. But even if that happens, it'll be tough to call it a perfect season. There were too many off-the-field problems earlier this year to call it that. Problems that could have become distractions had it not been for the senior leadership in Lincoln. 
It was meant to be a catchy slogan on the cover of the 1995 media guide. But when the player featured on the cover, preseason All-American Lawrence Phillips, was charged with misdemeanor assault on a former girlfriend, staying focused became a necessity. After that one weekend when we had, you know, just about every media outlet in the country here, you know, at practice or anything, we were, uh, we were really, could have been distracted from our football. The media and those outside the program spent much of the season scrutinizing Nebraska football and debating Tom Osborne's decisions. Inside the program, though, the players, during the week that followed Phillips' arrest, took it upon themselves to restore their reputation. Everybody was on Coach Osborne back about turning into a Miami, but, you know, we was trying to... We, it, it wasn't really his fault. It, it was our fault. We kept having these incidents coming up, and, you know, it was, just seemed like it was week after week after week, and, you know, finally we said, hey, this is enough. We got sick and tired of it, and, you know, we came to each other, and we was like, we're going to have a meeting, and, you know, the, the captains came and, you know, gathered most of the people. Whether you played a lot or whether you were at or not, that's when you, you had the opportunity to come out and express how you really felt about things that were going on. Oh, boy. It got ugly in that room, uh, you know. There were some things said, but in the long run, everyone stayed in that room. Nobody got up and nobody left. We wrote some stuff on the board. We said, hey, this is what we're going to do, and these are the things we're not going to do. We wrote up like 10 solutions of ways we can keep the players from getting in trouble, ways we can help players um, on the weekends and stuff where they can always come over to friends' house and hang out and play video games and something like that. The one solution was, you know, stay away from parties. and. Uh, you know, that's just, if, if you want to, you know, that's three months out of your time. You know, if you want to be a national championship team, you know, you got to sacrifice that if you're a team player. If not, you know, we don't want you around anyway. So we had to tell each other, you know, you're accountable for what you're doing. You know, t you know Tom Osborne, he just stick out, he stick his neck out for everybody. And, and then you guys go out and do something else that's, you know, outrageous. So, um, you know, we, we got to look out for him, too. I really don't know what, what they talked about, for sure. And... Uh... But they sure played. But they've done that you know, all year long. I think they felt like they needed to pull together and, and really uh, make a statement on the field. There are certain things you really can't respond to very well, and, uh, but you can by the way you play. That meeting set the tone for the future, to go forward as a team, a lesson they learned from the past. Last year, when Tommy went down, they said we couldn't win without Tommy, you know. Like, Tommy's the, Tommy's the whole team, you know, and everybody else is some scrub along for the ride. We came game after game, and we just played together, you know. But there's no superstars on that team, and together we won. I just think they carried on to this year, and we were just ready for anything that was going to happen. We learned from, from the past that, uh, we're not going to be able to stand there, and um, it, or if we do stand there, then uh, we're going to get washed away. That didn't happen. Despite the distractions and nonstop scrutiny of this season, Nebraska won by an average of 38 points a game. During last year's national championship run, that average margin of victory was 24 points. The things that happened, you know, you don't ever want those things to happen, but... I think it did make us a better team. We probably got a lot stronger than what we were before, which may, you know, mean trouble to other people, but not to us. Steve Cyphers, ESPN. And child's comments echoed by a lot of Nebraska players. You've been around off the field controversy as a player, Craig. These guys all say it's not a distraction unless you allow it to become one. And the players didn't allow it to become one. I want to talk about the magnitude of what happened there. Very seldom are there any teams at any level that you can get them in the same room without coaches and conduct themselves the way they did. That is an astronomical feat that they accomplished there. Why did it happen? It happened because of tradition. Very few teams have tradition like they have. True, long-running, deep roots that have given them the discipline that it takes to be a Nebraska football player. Great pride in that institution. Well, Craig, the main reason Nebraska got through the so-called hardships this year undefeated is very simple to me. They got more and better players than their opponents. Period. I don't care who the coach is. They just got a lot better players. They have been certainly disciplined since the Phillips incident. They point out a pretty spotless record. And it really hasn't been that tough a season as far as injuries. Not a single injury to any of the starters. That would be the kind of adversity that could cause them more problems that they had last year when Tommy Frazier was not there. Lawrence Phillips, if you haven't heard, he will get the start in tonight's Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. He faced the media all week. He hasn't said if he'll go to the draft, but many believe 
This is his final game with the Cornhuskers. As for the tickets, the scalpers not making a killing. You can get a ticket by not paying that much more than face price. We're coming back. Until last year, they did it in the Orange Bowl. The number one surrounded by the Red Gems. I think those guys flash those rings around. That would not be typically modest Nebraska attitude. We asked him what they'd done with their rings since getting them. Ring around ever? No. Where is it? My mom has it. I'm not a, I'm not a jewelry type person. It's very rare you see me wear rings or necklace or anything. I might wear a watch occasionally, but as far as jewelry, I'm not, I don't wear too much jewelry. You know, it's so much of an attention getter, especially here, that people just, you know, hound you about it all the time. They want to see it and, and touch it and take it off, and, and I think it's just best to just leave it at home. I think I maybe wore it one or two nights after I first got it, but that was it. My ring's at home. Uh, I got it sitting right beside my, uh, it's in my desk where I study all the time, and, uh, I usually polish it once a night. Do any of the guys wear their ring around? Yeah, they, they wear them all the time. My roommates wear theirs, too. They rub it in your face a little bit? Nah, they ain't rubbed it in. I told them, just hold on, I'm gonna get me one, just wait. Well, they're in a position to get that second consecutive ring because they have plugged holes better than any program in college football. They lose guys, other guys are plugged in. Offensive line, we never dreamed they'd be this good with four new starters. Terrell Farley is saw the Big 8 defensive newcomer of the year out of the junior college. The defensive line, they rebuilt the pass rush with Grant Wistrom and Jarrett Thomas, first-year starters, and Chris Brown, the true freshman kicker. They lose their kicker, number one pick in the baseball draft. They get a freshman, and he's had a great year, Craig. How about walk-ons? I mean, how good would that be to wake up one morning, know that you've got Jarrett Thomas filling in for you, 10 sacks on the season. Not only that, earns All-American honors. Jeff Makovica, Corey Schlesinger was, Schlesinger was excellent last year. This guy comes in, averages 5.9 for carry, and continues the attitude of fullbacks. Reggie Ball had 10 receptions the last four games. He's a great blocker and a potentially dangerous wide receiver. One thing you got to know about these guys, they're the Green Bay Packers of college football. Always somebody filling in there, coming along. That tradition we talked about earlier, it is always playing a role in everything they do mentally at Nebraska. But Craig, we all know we study history to predict the future, so let's take a look at this situation. Nebraska has lost seven of their last eight bowl games. Six of those seven teams were from the state of Florida, and all of those games, ladies and gentlemen, on grass. Gentlemen, that is not a coincidence. But that is in the past, Lee. Those are different <laughs> Nebraska teams, and the guys on this year's team, a lot of them won that title on grass. It always comes back to the grass field. For me, what's at stake? A lot of things, including the Sears Trophy. It's a Waterford Crystal took on the Canes. It was twice in Lincoln for the Kansas State game, back for the Iowa State game. It's been here. It's been at media day. It's been at press conferences. It was there for casino night. And then finally, it was packed away in the anvil case and gotten ready for the winner of tonight's championship game. Right now, across the street, it is sitting on the sidelines, it's on the Florida sidelines. The Gators technically the home team in this game. The home team has never lost when the football has visited their stadium. Would it be an omen? Of course, they'll probably think so. A lot more coming up as we count down to kickoff on college game day from Tempe, Arizona. 15 degrees and cloudy. In Gainesville, it's warm, but it's rainy. Out here in Tempe, Arizona, Another perfect night. It'll be cool. The temperature will drop into the low 50s by game time, but it has been fair all season, and that continues. All I wanted for Christmas was for Corso and James to pick the Gators. Well, the picks are coming up, but first across the street to our final report. And Steve Cyphers first. Steve's been with the Huskers all week. Steve? Chris, uh, Chris Brown, the kicker, the freshman kicker for Nebraska, has kicked all season long off artificial turf. He's got the assignment on the grass tonight. He told me just a few moments ago it's a good surface, and he'll, he'll be more than happy to kick off it. Mike? I just spun around, Steve, to check if David Barnard, the starting defensive lineman for Florida, was going to be in with the first team practicing. He wasn't, although he did go through drills. He has a shoulder stinger. He's an important guy, 97. Watch that. As you watch the game, the wind will be blowing lightly left to right. Hasn't really factored on the kicking or the passing. Danny Werfel looked very sharp in practice. And guys, I know you, I didn't get your Christmas gift this year, but let me tell you, this field gets torn up on Wednesday and sold for $30 a pop. So your gift will be there a little bit late this year. <laughs> Rask for Christmas. I'll I appreciate that, Mike. Thanks very much. 
A lot of factors. You talked about the field. You talked about who's been there before. I think Rick Neuheisel put this very well when he talked about Nebraska. He says you can try to match their intensity. Some teams can match their speed. Very few can match them physically. But hardly anybody has been able to match their execution. You have to match all those factors. It's why they've been 35-1 and one in the last 36 games. Your thoughts? 90% of those games are won on AstroTurf. These teams are equally strong. They're very good in all areas. But when important fact the game is played on grass grass slows the uh, ball down the ball goes through the air just as fast i'm taking florida <laughs> 31 28 because the game is played on grass oh, you talk about slowing down a game i don't think the grass really does that you look at notre dame the way they slowed down florida state all the play calling that lou holtz had in the game the same kind of play calling steve spurrier will have to slow down that great fast defense in nebraska Number two, Steve Spurrier better be in the locker room telling his guys you're playing a road game. Should have told them that a long time ago. But if they haven't figured it out yet, they're going to be booed quite a bit, and there'll be very little you Ray Gators. This is the kind of sign they've been passing around all week. It's kind of two-sided. Go Huskers, go Gators. It's called the waffling sign. We got to give that to you. Hey, by the way, <laughs> nice weatherman tie you got on there. Right. I'll tell you, we're back after the game. Plenty of post-game stuff. The women's pro billiards is next as we leave you from Tempe, Arizona, with still another beautiful sunset. We'll see you back here. After the game, keep those kicker, uh, clickers close at hand. <laughs>